Dr. Pugarendi Vijayaraman, cardiologist in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, USA. Dr. Pugarendi Vijayaraman specializes in cardiac ablations, electro cardiac electrophysiology, cardiac device implantation, and his bundle pacing. Dr. Pugarendi, a pioneer in conduction system pacing with landmark publications in reputed journals. We heartily welcome you, sir. Hi. Uh uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, for inviting me and be part of the faculty along with uh, uh, Dr. Vanita Aurora, Dr. Narasimhan, and uh, Dr. Roshan. Um, um, the topic for my presentation is uh, his funnel pacing and left funnel branch pacing techniques and indication. It's kind of a uh, a little bit of a broader topic. I'll try to do justice to the topic uh, as best as I can. These are my uh, disclosures. So currently for his funnel pacing and left funnel branch pacing, uh, there are several tools available. Early on, we only had a few tools, uh, the deflectable C304 sheath from Etronic along with the 3830 lead. Uh, which is a four French lead with no stylet and has to be delivered through a sheath, but with an exposed screw. And subsequently, the C315 his sheath, which has a septal curve, that actually made his funnel pacing a uh, lot more e easier to do compared to the older techniques. Currently, uh, Medtronic has these three sheaths, and the C304 his sheath, which is in the middle, which is a deflectable sheath with a septal curve, that allows his bundle and left bone facing to be uh, more easier than previously uh, experienced from the other catheters. Uh, the rest of the manufacturers are quickly uh, coming onto the scene with introducing uh, some of these different shaped sheets. Um, so depending on the patient's anatomy, we can choose. Uh, the advantage of these sheets is that uh, you can use a traditional uh, extendable retractable screw active fixation leads for his funnel pacing. Well, there's not a lot of uh, experience with this. Uh, I think uh, uh, there are more people performing and gaining experience. Most of our experience has been with the Medtronic 3830 leads. Um, for any procedure, you got to make it uh, simpler. Uh, and more user-friendly. So I typically use a Mayo stand, a support stand at, at the shoulder level uh, because these leads are longer, about 69 centimeters, almost uh, similar to the coronary sinus leads, and you need an extra room. And for while in the beginning we were performing just using fluoroscopy and a pacing system analyzer, uh, and a 12 lead ECG. So now with uh, multi-screen possibilities, it's good to have all of these options. Uh, have a, a fluoroscopy screen, a reference screen, have your uh, active recording station, and a review screen of the recorded electrogram. It allows you to immediately assess the response to pacing, which is critical in understanding his funnel pacing and left funnel branch pacing. Well, not always, absolutely necessary, but makes the procedure a lot more elegant and easier to do. Early in the experience, a mapping catheter was routinely used to locate the HIS, but we quickly realized that this adds more time but provides minimal advantage. So we have subsequently used primarily uh, mapping from the lead, uh, predominantly in a unipolar fashion, and uh, it provides excellent electrograms. Uh, this is just from the PSA itself. You can record the atrial his electrograms during implantation. Another thing that's uh, display the electrograms along with the 12 lead on a recording system and use the PSA to analyze the uh, amplitude of the signals uh, and the response to pacing uh, quickly. So the second thing I also do when I'm doing the recording is that have an additional channel with a different filter setting for the hispanol pacing lead. So here the high pass filter is changed to 0 0.5 hertz from the traditional 30 hertz 
this allows you to record the his bundle injury current, which is uh, important in terms of obtaining excellent pacing threshold. And in this situation, uh, you can see there is no ventricular injury current. So primarily here you get selective his bundle capture in this patient. So the newer tool um, is a deflectable sheath, which allows for more precise uh, mapping by sweeping the tricuspid septal annulus to uh, identify the His very quickly. Early on when we're using the C315 His sheath, it's learning how to manipulate the sheath to get through the various aspects. And sometimes it's challenging to um, find the resolution to map the His region for few millimeters in distance. Uh, sometimes you have to be very precise to get excellent threshold. So this sheet allows you to map a little better in that sense. So here is a patient uh, looking at the electrogram. I know that the atrial electrogram is larger. So it's primarily in the atrial side. So you gently clock the sheet and sweep towards the septum and superior tricuspid annulus. And very quickly, within seconds, you can identify the His signal. And as you can see here, there is the His signal. And so once I've identified the His signal, then basically advance the lead tip a little further and make one or two rotations to fix the lead to the uh, septal tissue and confirm that you still have good His electrograms. Now you have ventricular injury current, suggesting there is additional ventricular myocardium. The sensing signals should be adequate here. At this point, I tend to fix the lead and following fixation here, you can see significant his bundle injury current and ventricular injury current. And so that's a very good sign suggesting that the thresholds are going to be excellent in this patient. And so during testing here, we were able to demonstrate uh, non-selective his bundle pacing, which means you're capturing the his and the right ventricular septal myocardium. So the QRS is slightly wider, but the uh, rapidity of activation is pretty fast. And you can see the stimulus to peak LV activation time as measured in V5, V6 is about 85 milliseconds. And you can also see the retrograde atrial conduction. And when you lose the hispanal capture, this is around one volt. And you see here that there is wider stim to peak LV activation time. And the QRS activation is rather slow, just like a left funnel branch block pattern and RV septal capture. And the retrograde atrial conduction time gets prolonged because now we have to capture the myocardium, conduct through the right bundle, come up the His bundle, instead of going directly up the His bundle to have the shorter activation time. So that's to confirm that you have at least two capture threshold, like His bundle capture threshold and an RV capture threshold. So it's quite easy to understand that this one facing works very well in AV nodal block, as in this case. Uh, you have a nice his signal before every escape QRS complex in the patient with complete heart block. And pacing at that site, you create recreate the same QRS morphology. And that gives you excellent selective his funnel capture. But what is important to understand also is that most of the AV block uh, in patients with so-called HV block is a discrete disease. So here you have a patient with two to one AV block, relatively normal PR interval on the conducted beat with the right bundle branch block pattern, suggests that this most likely disease in the infranodal His region. And as demonstrated by the electrograms, you have an atrial signal, His signal, no conducted beat, and then conducted beat in a two to one fashion. But what is important is that pacing at this site, you're able to capture the distal HISPOC in the system, suggesting that the disease in the HISPOC itself is rather very discreet. And if you're at or beyond the site of block, you can capture the distal HISPOC in the system and recreate. And here you even corrected the underlying right bundle branch block and achieve normalized QRS morphology. So how do you map in this, it's important to map the His region to identify the best site from placing in patients with intra ACN block. So here's a nice example of a patient with uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement with a sapien valve. And in the initial mapping location, 
in this patient, we are able to identify a large atrial signal, his signal, and two to one kind of AV block. Uh, but you can see this is a slightly more proximal location. And despite that, pacing at this location results in selective capture of the distal his bundle and completely normalized conduction. And the thresholds are slightly higher, around two volts. So while this gives good outcome acutely, we don't know what the long-term outcome will be. So it's important to map a little more. So the, here the lead is moved only a few millimeters distally. And you can see that's about four millimeters beyond. And here you're having, in the earlier example, you had two to one HV block. Now you have two to one AV block with a hiss before every conducted beat, as you can see here, but no uh, hiss after the atrial signal. And here in this case, we are beyond the site of block at the uh, escape rhythm or conduction part of the uh, distal his bundle. And pacing here results in complete normalization of the PRS. And during the process of lead fixation, we crossed a transient right bundle branch block, which we solved within the next few hours. And so precise mapping is essential to go to the distal his bundle. And again, while implantation, it's important to know whether you are too proximal, too distal. In this situation where there's a nice his electrogram, there's good capture threshold, but however, there's a larger atrial electrogram and atrial injury current, suggesting that this is not a good place because the sensing is going to be inadequate. And the ventricular sensing was low, and there's evidence for far field atrial sensing here. So you need to move the lead slightly more distally to get to the distal his region so you can get better sensing at the same time preserving uh, distal his capture. And we use C315 his sheath. This sheath gives you the natural position of the hub. Right? This is at six o'clock, which means the, uh, the septal tip is pointing towards the septal surface in a per perpendicular angle. And when you want to rotate it slightly clockwise, you get towards the ventricular side and you do counterclockwise, you go slightly posteriorly on the inferior septum. Lead fixation, uh, it's always uh, necessary to make sure the sheath is quite stable as you're holding the sheath because the rotational motions, whatever it takes to get the sheath in place is necessary to maintain during lead fixation to prevent it from dislodging. And following the lead fixation, you can see this is a three to five rotations of the, and in between rotations hold the lead in place. And at the end of rotation, you want to see a torque back on the lead. That would suggest that uh, the lead screw is fully engaged into the septal tissue. If I don't see this, I, I'm a little nervous that I haven't fully engaged the screw. And that's critical before you pull the sheath back and uh, do your electrical measurements in both unipolar and bipolar fashion. Another thing to confirm good lead fixation is after the sheath is pulled back, you can see that the lead itself has a slightly more clockwise torque with an alpha loop here, which suggests that the lead is firmly engaged in the septal uh, tissue. If you don't see it, I would like to give another additional one or two turns to achieve this. If you over torque the lead, then this can twist on itself. So we don't want to do that. So the right amount of rotation is enough to get adequate fixation. Now there are alternative approaches, especially early in your experience. You can also use uh, uh, 3D mapping, but it's going to be expensive. But in patients who undergo AV node ablation, this may be an option. Uh, it also helps you with uh, the learning curve early on. So you can uh, use this a precision mapping. You can mark all of the sites with any quadrupolar catheter to locate the his region. You can also mark the regions where there is left bundle branch block correction. And then you can displace the, uh, display the lead, facing lead in uni or bipolar fashion. And fix the lead at that particular location. No need for further mapping, can take the lead to that location and fix it to achieve uh, his bundle capture with correction of left bundle branch block. And uh, we can use this in a minimal 
uh, fluoroscopy fashion, and this has been shown in several studies and uh, reproduced. And again, another situation where 3D mapping is very helpful is to uh, help in patients with complex congenital heart disease. So this one is a fairly straightforward, congenitally corrected uh, transplantation of great vessels. You can mark all of the history regions, and then subsequently you can uh, fix the lead in that particular uh, region. And here you have this patient with high-grade AV block. Uh, we're able to demonstrate excellent his uh, fixation and achieve uh, non-selective his bundle capture in this patient. This was a 14-year-old boy. Uh, some of the tips to shorten the procedure time. Um, if you are not able to locate the his within the five, first five minutes, you've changed tactics. If you're using a fixed curve sheath, you can change it to a reflectable sheath. And early in your experience, you can try to use the EP mapping catheter to locate the his. Often, locating the his is not the challenge. It's the fixation that's challenging. Uh, you need a full support of the sheath to achieve good his capture. Um, so change it to a deflectable sheath. Or if you have um, thresholds are high, then leave the first lead in place, bring a second sheath and lead and map close enough to identify a slightly better spot. Usually it is there, just that precise repositioning of the lead is essential. And there are, apart from acute implantation, where the high thresholds may be seen in 10% of the patients, and another 10% in patients with bundle branch block, the thresholds can be higher. Um, Infranodal AV block, about 25% of patients, I find it uh, it's not possible to achieve good uh, capture thresholds or capture of the distal his. Sensing can be challenging, and uh, if you don't account for the atrial uh, over-sensing, you may also end up with ventricular under-sensing in this situation. So alternative approaches have been designed to achieve conduction system pacing. While hispanal pacing theoretically is the most physiologic form of pacing, getting into the distal his bundle, it's more challenging because of the fibrous membrane septum. Maybe with the newer tools, it's possible in the future. But getting into the left bundle branch and uh, all of its distal branches has become more feasible with the technique described by uh, Dr. Wong from Encho, China. And the advantage is that you have great lower thresholds, more stable than his bundle thresholds. You'll almost always be able to pace beyond the site of block in the intraacean disease. And sensing is excellent. And you not only have left bundle capture, you, you know, you almost always have left septal myocardial capture, which is uh, a reasonable pacing approach in itself. The reason left bundle branch pacing is um, more appealing is that if you look at the LV and the cardial surface, the left bundle uh, branches into extensive arborization. And it doesn't matter where in this part of the septum your lead is, you can get into the conduction system and then it travels around in a very rapid fashion. So left ventricle activation becomes uh, much more effective and much more synchronized compared to RV septal pacing. So here's an example, just a proposed uh, cartoon. Uh, you Here you have a distal his region mapped and then the site where the right bundle branch uh, sorry, left bundle branch pacing uh, site starting on the right side of the septum. You don't want to go above the level of the distal his, as usually the right bundle originates and it goes slightly superiorly, and you can damage the right bundle branch trying to implant the lead. So you want to be below the level of the distal his as the uh, left bundle and predominantly the posterior fascicles runs in the posterior mid septum here. And once you have advanced the lead deep into the septum, uh, most often, I think 70 to 90% of patients in normal QRS, you should be able to demonstrate left bundle branch potential. And then you can uh, confirm his bundle, left bundle capture um, with the demonstration of uh, certain features. It's a little more challenging to confirm left bundle branch capture compared to uh, his bundle capture, but there are several methods to look at it. And here is uh, 
our approach to once you identify the hist location, you want to move the lead beyond the membrane of septum. That means you got to go at least one to two centimeters distal to the hispinal region um, because it's hard to penetrate the septal myocardium and go towards the RV apical side and orient the sheath and the lead in a perpendicular fashion to the septum. And once you're there, we basically rapidly rotate the lead much more rapidly than doing his funnel pacing, which is more deliberate and slow, and advance the lead forward and watching for the lead movement to advance without pushing the sheath back, as you can see here. And then once you've crossed, we would like to inject some dye through the septum, through the sheath to see how deep in the septum we have reached. And this is an LAO projection. You can see the lead is at least 10 to 12 millimeters deep in the septum, reaching the LV and the cardial surface. And you have to confirm that your LV septal capture and left bundle capture by looking for certain uh, characteristic. Here, usual venous access, locate the distal his bundle, go apically, as we mentioned earlier. One thing to watch is the pace QRS morphology in V1. Often you see a notch in the nadir of the V1 and V2. And as you advance the lead uh, while keeping the sheet perpendicular to the septum, and you want to see what happens to the notch in the, during pacing, intermittent pacing with advancing the lead, the notch in the cura should move towards the end of the R wave in V1, forming the right bundle branch block type delay in morphology. Then you can also look for the left bundle branch potentials in patients who have normal QRS or right bundle branch block. And you need to do maneuvers to confirm the left bundle branch capture and make sure you don't perforate the lead into the left ventricular cavity. And during uh, advancing the lead, constantly mon monitor the unipolar pacing impedance. and that gives you a clue to how deep the lead is in the septum. So here's a series of 12-lead uh, electrogram during lead advancement. So this is the notch in V1 we're talking about. As the lead is going deeper, the notch is moving further out and has this right bundle pattern. And the impedance goes up, and it, when it gets closer to the LV septal surface, this impedance starts dropping. And we don't want it to drop below 500, 400 ohms, because that would invariably mean septal perforation when it's below 400. And as you advance the lead, we're also looking at the time to peak LV activation, fairly long in an RV pacing. And as intraseptally, it gets shorter. And as it reaches and captures the left bundle, this becomes really short and fixed, usually under 80 milliseconds in normal QRS patients. And confirm the left bundle branch potentials at the end. One of the uh, advantages of left bundle branch pacing is that you don't have to map too much because the left bundle is a much larger area on the LV septal surface. So this technique from China uh, is to divide the RV on the RIO view into nine segments. And the left bundle, successful left bundle sites usually are between the second and the fifth quadrant, as you can see. In pacing anywhere, you can advance the lead deep and more than likely to get into the LV septal and the cardium where the left bundle branch is there. And here's a slightly different approach. Uh, so always fix the sheath. I usually give it to a second operator and there's the technique to rapidly rotate the lead with both the fingers. Make sure your gloves are relatively dry and well, the rotation is almost a one-to-one -one torque. And we, our current approach is to continuously advance the lead. It's not the number of rotation. It's a transmission of the torque and the forward motion into the septum. And I don't generally like to see a torque back on the lead when you stop rotation. That means the lead is penetrated in the septum. Unlike his funnel pacing, where we don't expect the lead to penetrate the septum, and it stops where the lead screw interfaces, and then it torques back. Here, we don't expect the torque back, and so that's a, a good sign that the lead has moved. More importantly, our advancement and the rotation of the lead continues until the PVC that are induced during lead fixation changes from a left bundle branch morphology 
to a narrow right bundle branch morphology. As soon as we see this, we stop. That means you're getting closer to the LV endocardial surface. Here's another patient. Uh, you can see the change in morphology. And as soon as you have a, a change to a right bundle branch morphology PVC, you reach the LV septal surface. Another example of a similar. So this approach now, we have looked at it in a retrospective large series that you will see the so-called fixation beats of the PVCs of the uh, right bundle branch morphology almost 90 plus percent of the time as you advance the lead. So it's very helpful in getting a successful site. How do you assess left bundle branch capture? So once we are deep septal, when we pace at high output, here you can see the stimulus to peak LV. And that prolongs. That means you're near the left bundle region, but you're not capturing at low output. Our goal is to capture the left bundle at a lower output. So that means you need to advance the lead further. So we advance the lead a little, few more rotations. Now you can see a complete right bundle branch pattern. And the stim to peak LV actuation time is about 84 milliseconds at high and at low output, suggesting that both at high and low output able to capture the left bundle. This is a transition from non-selective to selective left bundle branch capture. You can see the local electrogram separate from the pacing artifact, suggesting that the, at this low output, you're not capturing the LV septal myocardium, and the ability to demonstrate selective capture with a pure right bundle branch block pattern. Here's another example of a patient with left bundle branch block. In high output, his bundle pacing corrects the left bundle branch block. And subsequently, the lead was advanced deep into the LV septum. And during left funnel branch block, you don't anticipate uh, left funnel branch potential. But when there is a conducted B or a PVCs from right bundle branch morphology, you can demonstrate the left funnel branch potential, suggesting you are in the conduction system. And then pacing here during threshold testing, unipolar pacing, just from the tip, you have the so-called non-selective left bundle pacing, and at a lower output, the separation of the local myocardium, and this becomes selective capture. One advantage of left bundle branch pacing is that your tip electrode is in the LV septum, the ring electrode is almost um, right near the surface or sometimes embedded into the RV septal myocardium. So at a higher output, you can capture not only the LV septum left bundle, can also capture the RV septal myocardium. So that actually corrects for some of the right bundle branch morphology. Now this almost looks like a his bundle paste cure as morphology, except for the tiny little R wave on V1. And at a lower output, you lose the RV septal capture and you have this non-selective to selective left bundle branch pacing. So you can manipulate these different outputs and thresholds, confirm that you have left bundle branch capture. So apart from having a right bundle branch pattern, uh, you should be able to demonstrate left bundle branch potential in whom there is conduction in the left bundle branch. You should be able to identify transition from non-selective to selective capture or transition from non-selective to LV septal capture, depending on how close to the left bundle branch you are. Most often, peak LV activation time, less than 80 milliseconds is excellent in most patients with normal function, normal QRS. It's usually in cardiomyopathy, it's slightly longer, so under 90 milliseconds is generally acceptable. And you can also do program stimulation to separate the refractory periods of septal myocardium and the left funnel branch to prove there is left funnel branch capture. So this is a patient with cardiomyopathy, fairly wide uh, left funnel branch block, 170 milliseconds. And you can see his potentials in following the uh, lead advancement into the LV septum, we are demonstrating at a low output, non-selective left funnel branch pacing. And even further low output, you have selective left funnel branch capture and showing the full right funnel branch block pattern, which is a wider complex than non-selective left funnel branch pacing. We can confirm that this is indeed left funnel branch pacing because now we are doing his funnel pacing at a higher output, it completely corrects the left funnel branch block but you can see now we have restored conduction through the left bundle by his pacing with correction and the left bundle branch potential is present. 
And when there is no conduction to the left bundle branch, because there's no correction of the left bundle branch block, there are no potentials in the left bundle branch sleep. So these are helpful. And then you can combine the, adjust the AV delay so as to allow native conduction through the right bundle branch and fuse it with the left bundle pacing to get a QRS almost close to the his bundle pace QRS morphology that we have. So this is very helpful in patients who require cardiac resynchronization therapy. So echocardiographically, this is the same patient with severe LV dysfunction. You can see how the lead ring electrode is here, the tip electrode is in the LV septal myocardium. You can see angiographic view with contrast lining the LV septal surface. Short axis view again demonstrating the lead location in the LV endocardial surface. And, and similarly, I have a patient with a right bundle branch block, two to one HV block. These are two EKGs. One of them is his bundle pacing, the other one is left bundle branch pacing. You can almost achieve a similar QRS morphology, suggesting that conduction system capture can restore conduction not only in the left side but also the right side. And Top one is his bundle pacing, the bottom one is left bundle branch pacing in the same patient. Current guidelines suggest that in patients with bradycardia and LV dysfunction who have high uh, requirement for ventricular pacing, his bundle pacing is a class 2A indication for achieving physiologic left ventricular activation. And in patients, uh, these patients, biventricular pacing or right ventricular pacing may be acceptable. And in patients with AV nodal block and requiring uh, ventricular pacing, hispinal pacing is currently considered class 2B until we have additional studies to show evidence that hispinal pacing is better, um, then it's likely to move up to class 2A or 1 indication. And the European guidelines for patients who require AV node ablation in the setting of tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, hispanal pacing is considered a class one indication at this point. So how do I practice in our health system? Uh, conduction system pacing is what we perform 100% of the time, at least attempt. So every patient who has an indication for pacing, if they have a normal hispokinetic conduction, like AV nodal disease, sinus node disease, or if they have right bundle branch block, we, his bundle pacing is our primary approach. And we tr uh, try to get thresholds less than 1.5 volts. And if we're not able to achieve, then move on to left bundle branch pacing. In patients with H3 block, left bundle branch block, we have moved on to use left bundle branch pacing as a primary approach as it provides excellent threshold and better stability. Only if we are unsuccessful and if we have reduced LV function and heart failure, then we do biventricular pacing, otherwise RV septal pacing. How about patients for requiring cardiac resynchronization therapy? So currently, whether you have underlying right bundle, left bundle, or IVCD, as long as the QRS is wide, biventricular pacing is the gold standard. However, I think it's time to rethink our strategy for resynchronization therapy. So if you have a patient with right bundle branch block, his bundle pacing is going to be physiologically far better than biventricular pacing. So that is our primary approach. If we completely correct the right bundle branch block, so we stop right there. If you have partial correction or no correction, we can still use his bundle pacing and combine with RV pacing or even left bundle branch pacing because you have RV and LV septal capture in addition to left bundle capture to achieve maximal synchronization without causing left ventricular synchrony as you do so with biventricular pacing. On the other hand, in left bundle branch block, I think still biventricular pacing is the gold standard. We haven't proven that his bundle pacing is uh, better. Although uh, hemodynamic studies in mechanistic studies show that the hispon pacing is likely to be better. We have no randomized control trial showing superiority. Nonetheless, hispon pacing, if it causes complete correction of the left bundle branch block, that's a group of patients that's most likely to benefit from resynchronization therapy, whether it be hispon pacing or ideally placed left ventricular. So if we get good threshold, we accept hispon pacing. 
If the threshold is high, then we try left one branch facing in those patients. If we have only partial correction, then we try to use hispanal pacing plus LV septal pacing, LV uh, coronary sinus pacing, or left frontal branch pacing and coronary sinus pacing, so-called HIS-optimized left ventricular pacing or heart CRT. However, in patients with IVCD, we tend to combine spindle and LV pacing uh, to achieve the best resynchronization for those patients. So this has been our standard and we are testing this in a randomized clinical trial uh, trying to see if a his pacing based approach